Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. We have returning guest, Mr. Brent Johnson, who is one of the foremost experts on common law trust structure and uh, single membership LLCs, which we'll be talking about, which complement that. He is the host of the internationally renowned Global Freedom Report, as well as the wrong running freedom talk show, The Voice of Freedom. Brent is also the author of The American Sovereign, How to Live Free from Governmental Regulation, The Pursuit of Happiness, Freedom, as well as the Human Spirit, and the spiritual book, The Quiet Voice of God. He has a great website. You can find him at freedomradio.us. Uh, you can also listen to his podcast. You can reach him toll free at 888-385-3733. Additionally, Brent is the director of Freedom Bound International, which is a common law service center which helps educate people about their sovereign rights. And for more than 30 years, he's experienced ex more success than virtually anyone else in terms of teaching practical methods in living free from the endless tyranny of Big Brother. Brett is truly a modern day freedom fighter. Brent, with all that, welcome to the podcast once again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you, John. I really enjoyed it last time. I'm looking forward to it this time. Likewise. Now, you'll know, Brent, we talked about this offline for our audience. There's a specific reason why we brought you on at this particular time, which we're going to be discussing today. Um, Brent's done a fabulous job for us in the past, but we felt that we wanted to bring him on closer to the action of in respect to the uh, global reset financially, which is encroaching upon us, which we'll be discussing today. But before we get into that, um, what you do, uh, Brent, in my opinion, it complements so well both the pre and post reset aspect, right? And we've talked in the past about why people should have a trust, what type of trust they should have, and the specific mechanics of how it works. Since it's been a minute, um, can you talk a little bit about for the average layperson that's coming on who might be hearing about this but doesn't know the internal workings in, in as, as succinct as you can, why your common law trust is different from other ones and how it protects them in a post RV world environment? Okay, well, f first off, it's probably uh, improper to say why your common law trust is better than others, because I have yet to see any valid common law trusts out there outside of the ones that we offer at Freedom Bound. Uh, I have, as a consultant, I have reviewed over 500 trusts in my time, supposedly common law trusts, and I only found one that actually passed muster because the people who have offered common law trust do not have a good grasp on why they are so effective at protecting the property put in them from government intrusion. Um, many common law trusts out there will set up an EIN. An EIN is a taxpayer ID number that is the property of the US corporate government. And when an EIN is attached to a trust, that trust becomes statutory in nature. So a common law trust does not have an EIN and cannot have an EIN attached to it. And so that's why I, I don't I don't make a, a comparison between me and the next guy. I simply don't see genuine common law trusts out there outside of what I do. So just to give you a little background, first off, a trust, any trust is a right of property held by one party for the benefit of another party. That is the legal definition of a trust. Now, you go to a fancy restaurant, you give the keys to your car, to the valet to park your car. That's a trust. That is actually what's called an implied trust because it's not written down anywhere. If it was written down, it would be an express trust. But that valet has control over the vehicle. He can put the keys in, turn the motor on, and take that vehicle into the parking lot and park it wherever he decides to park it. He doesn't have to check with you and say, can I park it here or can I park it there? He has control of that vehicle for your benefit. What he can't do is while you're having dinner, he cannot go cruising up and down the boulevard in, his, uh, in, in your car to impress his friends, because that would not be for your benefit. So that's what a trust is. Now, a trust can be statutory and can be common law. A statutory trust gets its existence because the legislature passed a law 
creating that trust. And whatever the legislature has created, the legislature controls. And so the rules governing such trust, statutory trust, can be changed at any time. About a year and a half ago, the IRS passed a rule that changed the rules governing certain types of statutory trusts. It used to be that if you had your children as beneficiaries on a statutory trust and something happened to you and your children became the either the trustees or the beneficiaries of that trust, they didn't have to pay tax on the property that was held in that trust. The IRS just changed that rule about a year and a half ago so that now your children would have to pay tax on that. The reason they can change the rule is that the legislature has control over statutory trusts. That is not true for a common law trust. Common law trusts get their existence from fundamental common law. Common law, just so you understand, is the unwritten law of social interaction. It predates all government, and so no government can abrogate or, uh, or um, cancel common law. They can't say, okay, we no longer have common law. This replaces common law because they did not create it. And you will actually find in statutory law, you will find provisions in just about every statutory law. You will find provisions that say the provisions of this law must be in harmony with the common law because government didn't create it. Government doesn't control it. And so a common law trust, which is actually called a pure trust organization, a common law pure trust organization does not get its existence from statutory law and the statutory courts and the statutory government have no control over it. They cannot change the rules governing it because they didn't, they weren't involved in the creation of that type of trust. Now, there are certain differences between a common law trust and a statutory trust. The primary difference between them goes to the issue of legal control over the property held in trust. In a statutory trust, the grantor can also be the trustee or the grantor's wife or husband can be the trustee. And as such, the grantor retains legal control over the assets held in the trust. That is not the case in a common law trust. In a common law trust, it's not called the grantor. It's called the exchanger. That's the party of the first part to a common law trust. And the exchanger actually gives up legal control of the property put in trust to the trust. Now, the trust then owns that property for the exchanger's benefit. So the trust itself cannot use the property for its own purposes. It must manage and administer that property for the benefit of the holders of beneficial interest in the trust. And the first holder of beneficial interest is always the exchanger. Because the exchanger, the reason the exchanger is called that is that the initial transfer of property into a common law trust is not a gift and is not a sale. It is an exchange, a trade, where the property is being put in trust and in exchange, the exchanger is receiving the beneficial interest in that trust. Trust is a right of property created by one party for the benefit of another party. And the exchanger is that initial holder of beneficial interest. Beneficial interest is embodied in 100 units always, never more, never less. And they can be shared with others. Maybe, maybe the beneficial interest holder wants to give 50 units over to his spouse. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Then the spouse would also have 50% 50, 50 of the beneficial interest and the exchanger would have 50% of the beneficial interest. So the beneficial interest holders could change over time. But the trust exists to manage and administer property for their benefit. Now, in a common law trust, there are four principles. They are the exchanger, who's the party of the first part, 
and signs the contract creating the trust. The creator, who is an independent party to the exchanger, cannot be a relative, who is the party of the second part. The two of them sign the contract creating the trust. Then the creator appoints the fiduciary owner, which is the trustee. I don't like using words that are used in statutory trusts, in common law trusts, so I don't use the word trustee, but it's the same thing. It, we call it the fiduciary owner. So the creator appoints that party, and then the fiduciary owner manages and administers the trust property for the benefit of the holders of beneficial interest. The fiduciary owner cannot be a relative of the exchanger. The fourth principle in a common law trust, which doesn't exist in a statutory trust, is the protector. The protector's job is to ensure that the trust always acts for your benefit. And if the trust does not act for your benefit, the protector has the power to fire the fiduciary owner and install a new one. So let's say I'm the fiduciary owner, okay? And you're the holder of beneficial interest. And you want um, you want to take the house out of the trust, okay? And I might say to you, have your protector send me a request letter. I don't actually need it, but having that letter from the protector strengthens my ability to defend the trust in case it's attacked. So... Okay, your protector comes and sends me a request letter. Please take the property out of the trust. I refuse. I say, no, I, I, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Protector can fire me just like that. Just as if a trust minute, the protector signs it. Brent Johnson is hereby removed as fiduciary owner and somebody else is installed in that position. There always has to be a trustee. So somebody is installed in that position, but that's what the protector does. Again, the protector cannot be a relative of the exchanger. The reason for that is what the difference is between a statutory and common law trust. In a common law trust, legal control of the assets held in trust must vest with the trust alone. They cannot vest with the exchanger, they cannot vest with the protector. And so if, for example, in a statutory trust, you could be the grantor and your wife could be the trustee, that's perfectly allowable. But in a common law trust, if you were the exchanger and your wife was the fiduciary owner, you would be considered to have legal control over the property and trust. That would result in the common law protections of the trust being disallowed and the trust being treated as a statutory trust, even though the trust contract says this is a common law document. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember or if maybe you're not old enough to remember this. I'm not sure. But there was a woman named Lynn Meredith many years ago. She was a, a figure in, in this movement. And she was a promoter. She was a very good promoter, but she was not a researcher and she was not an educator. Her big claim to fame was a book called Vulture in Eagle's Clothing, which pretty much contained material from other authors that she compiled and put into the book. Okay. Well, we won't discuss whether that's plagiarism or not. It's not a part, it's not a, a factor in this, in this discussion, but um, Lynn Meredith sold what she called common law trusts. And with the common law trust, she provided the buyer with a trust identification number. And she was very clear to say, this is not a taxpayer ID number. It is a trust ID number. As it happens, it had nine digits to it. She would then instruct the buyer to take the trust and provide the trust along with that number to a bank and they would open up the account. So people would go in and they would get accounts opened for these common law, supposedly common law trusts, okay, using the TIN, the trust identification number. Well, needless to say, TIN is a taxpayer ID number. And if it looks like a rose and it smells like a rose, it's a rose. And sure enough, 
Lynn Meredith was prosecuted for fraud, all of her clients who had opened up bank accounts with these trust ID numbers had their accounts closed completely. And she went to jail for a number of years. Now, she made about six and a half million dollars because she was a good promoter. But she what she did not know how to support or even answer questions about the things that she offered to people. She herself didn't have a trust. Um, she talked to people about getting rid of their social security numbers, but she had her own social security number. She talked to people about getting out of the IRS and the income tax, but she paid the income tax. In other words, she was not an example of what she was selling. And she ended up going to jail for it because the TIN was, it looked like a taxpayer ID number and it was used for that purpose. And therefore calling it something else simply constituted fraud, or I think it was constructive fraud. Um, and she ended up going to jail. My point being that if you properly deal with a common law trust, if you deal with the legal control issue correctly, the trust itself is impenetrable. We've been doing these trusts for over 30 years. We have never had one trust beaten down. Never has an attack on a trust been successful. And we've been attacked by the IRS and we've been attacked by the DOD. And we've had individuals who've decided they wanna pierce the trust veil. Nobody has succeeded ever. Okay, that's a serious statement, okay, because I understand the issue of legal control, and it's the only issue that matters with a common law trust. Nothing else matters. If you address legal control properly, your trust is impenetrable, but you do have to give up that legal control. What you end up with is practical control. For example, you put your put your house into trust. The, the trust owns the house now, and the house is going to be, there's going to be a, a warranty deed sent down to the recorder so that it can be put in the public record that the trust owns that property. Now, if somebody has a grievance against you, let's say the IRS says you owe them a million dollars, okay, and you say, I don't, and they say you do, and you dance for a while. Well, the IRS cannot come and take the house. Why? Because you don't own it. It's not your property. They simply can't take it, okay? Now, um, if you had legal control, the common law protections would be disallowed and they could take it. So that's the significant difference between a common law and a statutory trust. Now, once the property is recorded in the public record as being owned by the trust, the trust will then issue you, generally it would be you, a general manager's contract hiring you. Your job is to take care of the house, keep it in good condition, mow the lawns, something's broken, fix it. Your compensation, this is a contract, so there has to be a consideration. Your compensation is that you and your family get to live there rent free. So now you're doing all the things that you used to do as the owner of the property, carrying liability for the property. But now you are simply a worker. You are a tenant. You have lawful possession of the property, but you do not carry the legal ownership, the liability of legal ownership. That is the, the distinction. So that now somebody falls on the porch, they can't sue you. Because, hey, buddy, I just work here. You're going to have to go talk to the owner. And that's the distinction between a common law trust and a statutory trust. That's what makes them different. Um, many people, when I was reviewing 500 trusts, this is what I found to be true, that many of the people offering these trusts didn't properly understand the principle of legal control and why it was so important. Because they would actually issue management contracts, like what Lynn Meredith did. They would issue management contracts giving legal control back to the exchanger. And their argument would be, well, it's a contract. The Constitution prohibits the government from obstructing a contract. That's true, but it's irrelevant because what the contract did was it changed the fundamental character of the principles of the trust. 
so that the exchanger who gave up legal control was actually given back legal control of the property. The legal definition of legal control, by the way, is the ability to buy, sell, and hypothecate property. Hypothecate means borrow against. So when you put your house into trust, you can't sell the house anymore. The trust can sell the house and distribute the funds to you. Distribution from a common law trust is not a taxable event, by the way. Okay, that can happen. Okay, but you cannot sell the house and you cannot go and refinance the house because it's not yours anymore. If you want to refinance the house, the house can be transferred out of the trust back into your name, then you can refinance it. But if you do that, you can't put it back in the same trust. You would have to create a new trust because putting it back in the same trust is structuring and uh, that won't work. Right. Which is why you have always said, Brent, the time I've known you, one of the catchphrases you always talk about is ownership equals liability. So this right. is, in, in my mind, this is the good side of what the bad guys, you'll own nothing and be happy is actually the good side of the antidote of that, of that equation or that commentary. So with that being said, Brent, thank you again for the articulate explanation as always. So taking that a step further now, two questions wrapped inside of one, because I know you can multitask. Firstly is how many trustees do you recommend the average person have on their trust? Does it matter even? And secondly, there's a whole scuttlebutt within our, our community and the Patriot community I'm referring to with respect to, well, Nasara is going to bail us out of, of income tax. So why do we need a trust? So can you speak to that and explain to people why that, that they're mutually exclusive? Okay. What was the first question? Um, how many trustees do people ah, need? Okay. And does that even matter? Okay. Um, my recommendation is one trustee. We call it fiduciary owner. Okay. The reason I recommend that is because the protector, as I said, has the power to remove that person if that person misbehaves. But if there are three or more members of the board of fiduciary owners, there's always a board. If there are three or more members, the protector's discharge power is removed from him and it falls to the board itself. So let's say there are three trustees and one of them misbehaves. It's up to the other two to remove that person, okay? If there are two on the board, then the protector can team up with the other trustee, not the misbehaving one, but the one that's behaving properly. And the two of them can remove that one trustee. But if there is only one trustee, that power is exclusively for the protector. And the protector is there to protect the beneficial interest holders, to protect their interest. So I would generally not want to emasculate the power of the protector. The protector would have other things to do. The protector keeps a copy of the trust all the time. The protector may be asked for some letters to submit to the board. But the most important thing the protector does is that discharge power. If you're the, if you're the beneficial interest holder, that should give you some solace knowing that if somebody misbehaves, you have somebody who is going to take care of that for you. You don't want to take away that power. So number one reason for why I would only have one fiduciary owner. The other reason is that if I have multiple fiduciary owners on the board, and I let's say, let's say I'm the principal fiduciary owner, I'm the first one, okay? And let's say I have to do something. I now need to take that trust minute and send it to the other fiduciary owners and get them to sign it before I can move forward. So it slows everything down as well. Um, for those reasons, I recommend a single person on the board at one time. But I do have I do have one or two clients who have specifically asked for multiple fiduciary owners, and you know I'm happy to accommodate them. But you asked me my opinion. And that would be my opinion on that. Second question. Okay. Nisera is going to come and save the world. Maybe that's true. And maybe that's not. Theoretically, when Nisera is officially announced, okay, all administrative agencies will cease to exist. No more IRS, 
no more Social Security Administration, no more, um, you know, health and human services. No, none of it. All of it is going to stop existing, according to Nasera. There is a question whether politics will allow that to happen quickly. Okay. Um, for example, people are going to be up in arms about how can you take my Social Security? Even though Social Security is not an entitlement, you're told it is. It is not. It is a benefit. And as a benefit, it is up to the government whether or not to give it to you. Uh, I mean, remember when Social Security started, the promise was when you turn 55, you'll get your Social Security. Then they raised it to 57, then 60, then 63. Well, if if Social Security represented any kind of a contract between you and the government, how could they change the terms of the contract? It's not. It's a benefit. And a benefit is issued at the discretion of the issuer. You have no say in it. You have absolutely, well, I paid into it. And the money you paid into it went directly into the general fund and was spent immediately. Your money is gone. It wasn't put in an account for you. It's not like a private pension where you are entitled to it because you did the work. Not at all. And you may not like hearing it, but that's the truth about Social Security. So if Social Security is going to be dismantled, people are going to be up in arms about that. Um, it is possible, and we have heard this, that there may be a substantial uh, funding of the American people that will offset all the fraud that's been perpetrated on them. And if that happens, you won't need Social Security. But nevertheless, anytime you make a massive change in the structure of government, there are always forces that resist that change. The inertia is tremendous. So, so I don't know that all the things we think are going to happen under Nisera will happen overnight. And possibly, okay, politics being what it is, will happen at all. Um, I hope they do. Uh, under Nisera, we would go back to strict constitutional rule of law. That means every single, um, every single amendment from the 14th on is invalid. Okay, the original 13th Amendment, the title of Nobility's Amendment, would be restored to the 13th Amendment. And what we consider the 13th Amendment would become the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, as we know it, was never ratified. And I have, I have a copy of the congressional record in which Congress actually admitted that. Okay, actually in session. I have it. So I know that this is true. Um, the other amendments would be invalid. The 16th Amendment has no enabling clause, meaning it's pointless. An enabling clause is, uh, you'll see it in the 15th, the 17th, the 18th. It says something like, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. That clause has to be there because without it, Congress has no power to enforce the article. The 16th Amendment has no enabling clause. So it's 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 ridiculous. The 17th Amendment, 17th Amendment supposedly made senator an elected position. But the original Constitution says clearly no state shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate without its consent. You see, the Senate used to be selected by an act of the legislatures of each state. So the legislatures would, you know, vote on a couple of people and then they would submit those people and these will be the senators representing that state. The idea was the House would represent the will of the people. The Senate would represent the will of the states or the interest of the states. Mm -hmm. And when the two agreed, and only when the two agreed, you would get a federal law. And you may say, well, that would make it real tough to have a law. That was the whole idea. It wasn't supposed to be easy to make a law. So the 17th Amendment goes away. The 18th goes away. All of them, they disappear. We go back to constitutional rule of law under Nisera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've been told that lawyers and judges are being retrained 
in right. common law because right. it will be much more of a factor. There will be no more administrative law, no more U.S. codes. If you actually look for the law, federal law, you'll find it in the U.S. statutes at large. That's where you'll find it. And by the way, every single section of the statutes at large has an enacting clause, similar to an enabling clause, but on a state level. Uh, every one of them has an enacting clause. The codes don't. They're simply not there. So all of this is supposed to change with Nisera. Why do we want trusts after that? Well, it's a very simple reason. Fundamental law doesn't change. And fundamental law, as you mentioned before, is ownership equals liability. The owner of property is always liable for damage caused by that property, even if the owner doesn't realize that that liability exists. So the idea, you know, there are two, the two most significant reasons for creating a common law trust are number one, privacy. It is an unincorporated contractual organization. That's what it is. Like IBM is an corporation, an inc. A common law trust is a UCO. That means it's not in the public record anywhere. It's a private contract. Nobody knows you've been involved in setting up a trust of this sort unless you tell them. So that privacy is number one. Number two is reduce liability. And in the case of you as an individual, you can eliminate liability. If you own nothing, you have no liability. And if you have no liability, the bad guys who will still exist after Nisera, we like to think they'll all be removed, but there will always be bad guys out there. Right. And the bad guys look for your liabilities to go after your assets. If you have no liability, you are left alone to live your life in peace and freedom, which is the whole point. So yeah. those are the reasons you would continue to use a common law trust or trusts even after Nisera. Don't look to Nisera to be the solution. Look to your actions to protect your rights. You know, because you sit there, you think it's a document will protect me. If I just file the right thing in the right court, it will protect me. That doesn't do it, mm -hmm. especially when you have criminals in government, which is what we have today. So well said, Brandon, and, and I agree. You can never get rid of corruption 100%, but we could probably cut it down about 90, but you're always going to have a faction. But if we can get, if we can wrest enough control of it, then we can move it in a position of power for us and not not the bad people right and i we do know in our research of our team nasar to be real and it's been worked on as you know for decades it's not a new new uh, uh idea or philosophy mm -hmm. it's, you know it's 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 been put into law there's even something we show where google is acknowledging it finally after denying it for so long i think the point of this though for that you articulated was for people to see the very powerful underrated point you just made is is while Nassar is real and it will do many things, don't rely on that alone to be your backstop. You know, take decisive action, just like you have with this financial opportunity. Don't just sit on mm -hmm. the sidelines and wait for somebody to bail you out, is be proactively involved in, in the movement of your mm -hmm. life. Go ahead. And, 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 and by the way, you know, if you put something in trust, okay, maybe someday you want to take it out of trust, you can do that. <laughs> you know, you're, it, it's not like, it, it's not like you, you, that's it, you know, it's all done. And now you never again have that property. You, if you want to take that out of trust, you can take that out of trust, you know? So there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Uh, it's not like you're burning bridges or anything of that sort. Um, the, the, the other thing is that the wealthiest people in the world own nothing. Um, I, uh, if if you've heard one of my previous uh, appearances on a podcast or on a broadcast, you may have heard this story, but it's a good story to tell again. True story. John F. Kennedy had a cat. When you're John F. Kennedy, you don't own the cat. And sure enough, the cat was held in a common law pure trust organization, similar to these trusts. And the cat was the only thing in the trust. And one day the cat scratched somebody badly on the face. The guy said, I've been scratched by a Kennedy cat. I'll sue. So he did. He sued. He won the case and he was awarded the cat. Now, everybody laughs, but there's a moral to the story. 
if Kennedy had one of his mansions or yachts or Rolls Royces in the same trust as the cat, it could have been attached to satisfy the damage award from the case. But because the only thing in the trust was the cat, the guy got the cat. And, you know, there's, there's a lesson there about liability. So what you own carries with it liability. If you own nothing, you have none. The other Kennedy story, Ted Kennedy, you may remember him, and Mary Jo Kopechny, 29-year-old companion who was with him driving over Chappaquiddick Bridge in uh, Massachusetts in 1969. He was drunk as a skunk, and he literally drove off the bridge into the water. She died, he didn't. Immediately after this, he was caught on video stumbling around. I mean, the whole world knew that Kennedy was responsible, that it was his fault, that he was drunk. No question about it. <laughs> Mary Jo Kopechny's parents sued Kennedy for the wrongful death of their daughter. The insurance company lawyers came to the parents and said, we will offer you $30,000, it's from a Kennedy, Okay, $30,000, if you don't take it, you will get nothing because John, uh, because Ted Kennedy owns nothing. And as it happens, Ted Kennedy had in the public record, he had something called a notice of civil death, which means that he could not own anything. This is what the wealthiest people in the world do all the time. We own nothing, so we have no liability. You're not supposed to know that. You're supposed to do what the attorneys tell you and do what the accountants tell you and go out and go into debt for 30 years to buy a house that you can't afford to buy so that you're, you and your family are indebted for the rest of your life. While the rest of those wealthy people don't go through any of that stuff because they don't need to because they carry no liability so just a couple of pieces of info on that but no i i i, I do believe Miss sarah is coming okay the official announcement um but i do not believe that it would be wise to have property in your own name and it's but, not because of what the wef said they say own nothing and be happy in this case mm -hmm. like you say in this case own nothing you know and be free yeah Exactly. I was just trying to show people the inverse of the statement, because whatever the, the cabal does, they always make an antidote for themselves. It's just that now with with people like us, we're working to help people see that there's a antidote for them as well, and not just for the bad guys, that the paradigm is shifting. Exactly. So, so with that said, um, the last part of our show, saving, it's all good. It's just saving the best for last, uh, the financial component. I'll, I'll start with what I have as information and let you finish off the back end of it, kind of set you up, if you will. Um, two great pieces of information that have come our way in the last, this morning and also in the last couple of days, as you're probably aware, uh, Zimbabwe is moving their RTG dollars into gold back dollars in Zimbabwe under the NGI symbol that have QR codes on them, which is part of the new digital economic reality, but are going to be gold asset backed because they have the gold, they have the diamonds, you know all this, and that most of our audience knows this. Um, they do need to get rid of the corruption before anything can become official, but that's part and parcel of everywhere in the world right now. That's what we're seeing happening more and more, as you can see, behind back to front of scenes. But we're optimistic because uh, once Ch Nelson Chamisa, when they have their elections in August, and he is the people's choice like Trump is here, and, you know, the countries copy each other, right? Uh, I, I'm not I'm saying this for the people in the cheap seats. You already know this, Brent, <laughs> is the fact that um, that sets up the Zimbabwe bonds to be gold backed as well, which many people are holding. So that that's a significant event happening. What came across our desk this morning was very exciting, which we shared in our telegram, uh, which is to say that um, you know, people hear me out when I say this, because again, it, we, we can't pay attention to how things appear to be, but what the symbolism of them actually is with respect to uh, Israel coming out and saying adamantly, you know, in the mainstream media that if when Iran attacks them, which we know is a scripted event, Iran is being said to be the bad guy, and they have been holding up Iraq to this point along with our U.S. deep state government, uh, what will happen is Israel is going to declare a counterstrike, a 
of hitting the secret nuclear power plants, which has been the Kim Clement prophetic event. Also, Matthew Foot Forward has been talking about that on his YouTube channel for several years. That's the event that we've told our audience about for quite some time, if you don't already know, Brent, which is going to do two things. It'll free up Iraq to reinstate, but it will also take the U.S. hand off of, off of Iraq and also free them from Iran and also will free up Palestine and Syria and Turkey and many of the neighboring Middle East nations, Saudi Arabia and the like, from all of this corruption and dollar laundering and so forth. So that's a huge predictive programming event that has been proclamated publicly, which tells me that that this is this is coming up in the not too distant future. So that's what we have to share. And I'll turn it over to you for what you have on your musings with the reset. Um, there's been a lot of talk about projects, humanitarian projects. Now, pretty much everybody involved wants you to do a project, but you are not required to have a project, okay? Uh, the ones who are required are the whales, what they call the whales or the sovereigns. The ones who have thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes of these historical bonds, they are going to have to you know, do some humanitarian work, but you are not required to do so. Now, again, everybody hopes you will, Okay, because you're going to have plenty of money to be able to do that. But I don't want you to think you have to. Oh, my God, I don't have my project. What am I going to do? What do I do? I've got to I'm going to have to go into my redemption appointment and I don't have my project. You'll be OK. You'll be fine. If you are concerned that you should have a project and you don't have one, my suggestion would be think of one and just write up a summary. A summary is a one page, maybe two page document who, what, when, where, and how, one or two paragraphs each. It shows that you've thought about something. You've had, you know, and you could put that together if it worries you. If you think that walking in without a project is going to hurt your rates or things like that, it's not going to. You mm -hmm. don't need a project. Additionally, nobody is going to evaluate your project, okay, uh, and then give you a higher rate because of it. That's been talked about for a long time. It's not going to happen. Number one, they don't have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what are you going to do? Sit there. Well, let me look over the pro. I've got to ask you some questions and you got to give me some answers. And we got, you know, our, our 15 to 30 minute meeting has just gone into two to three hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to sit there evaluating your project and deciding you can get a higher rate. Everybody's going to pretty much have the same rate formula. There are some groups, groups that have contract rates. Okay. That means exactly what it sounds like. They have entered a contract to receive those rates. And those rates will be given to those groups that have those contracts. Everybody else is going to be on the same playing field. And it's going to be a very nice playing field. Now, another thing is that there are some scam artists out there putting out information that you can now sign up for and get your QFS account. And... You're going to get it sooner than everybody else. And you're going to have a better rate than everybody else. And they're telling you exactly what you want to hear. You know, this is a time for con artists to come out of the woodwork because it is a tremendous opportunity for con artists. People are, you know, people are so tired of waiting. They're, you know, a lot of people are in financial turmoil. You know, uh, I'm running out of money. I mean, it's, it's getting bad. And then... Somebody comes along and says, oh, man, we're going to get you a great rate. We're going to get you your QFS account now. It's not going to happen. It is a scam. The And, and frequently, these so-called opportunities are actually promoted by people who have good reputations. Okay. Those people may be themselves misled by it because con artists are very good at telling a good story. So please, nobody can get you QFS accounts right now. Absolutely nobody. Just be patient. Do mm -hmm. not sign up with such programs. You may well lose your funds if you do. 
Do not part with your currencies and or your bonds for any reason until you are in the meeting to exchange or redeem them. And only then, when you've gone through all the processes, done the NDAs and whatever else you have to do, and they're ready to open up the account, then and only then do you actually part with your dinar or your dong or your zim or your bolivar or whatever else you have. Mm -hmm. um, please, I really do not want to hear from people afterwards who say, I got scammed. You know, I've been doing my best to put this information out to people whenever it comes up. And it comes up a lot because there are a lot of con artists out there. One more thing. Uh, it has been suggested by people I consider to be very credible that it would be a good idea if you haven't already done so to make a list of serial numbers of your Zim bonds. Now, me, I have serial numbers of everything. Okay, Bolivar, uh, uh, Dinar, Don, well, not Dinar, because I, I, I did get a conversion program, but I haven't actually gone through the process of converting from Farsi yet. Um, but I've got my Dung serial numbers, my Zim serial numbers and, and other stuff as well. But specifically, I was told, make sure you have a list of serial numbers for your Zim bonds. So it shouldn't be too much work for you to do it. Make up a word file, put the denomination of the note and the serial number of the note. Real simple. Save the file. You'll be fine. But that's some of what has just recently come down the pike to me that I wanted to share with all of you. Also, we are now at the end of Ramadan. That suggests, and there is strong suggestion, strong implication that I hope to know more in a day or two, but there's strong implication that that's going to free up Iraq to finally release the official international rate on the dinar. Well, we'll certainly see. You know, it's all very promising what's happening. The other thing too, Brent, to add to the cachet of what you were just sharing is we we put out there, uh, the late great Benny Wilson, had, uh, who I had a chance to talk to years ago, always said accurately as a former banker that they would try to, meaning the bad guys, would try to hurt you before the RV, during the RV, and after the RV. So it's a vigilant process throughout that we need to take, to your point. Um, the other thing I would add, and I, I said this, on a show with Denise Boland last week is um, there's a chance because the U.S. hates competition, meaning the deep state specifically for those who are confused, is that uh, they hate competition. And as a result, uh, they're going to be upset when this does happen. So they they may try to put sanctions on the bank, the banking system, you know, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan for one to three weeks. And people must not panic. They must just relax. Let that pass. Sudani will come out and say those sanctions have been lifted. Uh, because people are going to, some people were going to get reactionary to your point and try to run and game the system and get around it and get themselves into, you know, a lot of trouble and lose all the, the wealth they spent years acquiring. And, and please, please do not breach the NDA. We don't know exactly what's in it, but it's, it's not going to be unreasonable. Okay. But don't breach the NDA. Okay. Um, and especially don't tell your children, your teenage children, that I'm now very wealthy because they're going to go tell all their friends and somehow that NDA is going to get breached. So don't breach the NDA. Here's another thing. When you first sit down for your meeting, ask if there is any facial recognition um, hardware or software in the room. If there is, I suggest you ask them to either turn it off or move to another room. Mm -hmm. You have every right not to have your meeting, okay, recorded on facial recognition because anything that's done with facial recognition is hackable. Absolutely. You're talking about large sums here. You do not want facial recognition in the room where you're conducting your meeting because then Indeed, others will know what you've done, what you've got, you know, and it will it will increase the size of the target that you will wear when you leave that room. Good point. 
We also recommend people go to a to a bank in a different town than where they live, you know, and go with a buddy system as well. And and you know, there's this all this scuttlebutt of oh, I can get ten or fifteen thousand dollars worth of cash. Why would you want that much cash on you to begin with? You know, I mean, how many people actually have ever carried that much? Mm-hmm. Not many. Uh, I'm sure you can get cash, but don't you know? Common sense. Don't be ostentatious about it. Just be very subtle and, you know, control yourself as much as yeah. you can until you get D- out of there. Don't buy a brand new Jaguar and drive it up and down your local street and park it in your driveway. The You know, I mean, because what you're doing is you're telegraphing that, look at me. Hmm. You don't want to go look at me. You want to, don't look at me. That's that's how right. you want it to be. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the whole point of these trusts is to give you privacy and an anonymity. And that's just as consistent with that theme. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, Brent, thank you so much for your time. As always, we appreciate always invaluable information and copious amounts at that. Uh, where can people find out about your work and last thoughts you have for the audience today? Okay. Well, uh, easiest thing, you can always call me toll free at 888-385-FREE. That's 888-385-375. Three, three. Okay. And I'd love to hear from you there. And we actually answer the phone. We have, we do not have an automated AI system answering the phone. You will get a human being, or you'll have to leave a message and you'll get a call back from a human being. Um, so do give us a call. The other thing is that uh, you can always go to the website, which is www.freedomradio.us. Freedomradio.us. Tremendous website, by the way. You will enjoy it. There's just tons of stuff on there. Um, You can find out in there about uh, the uh, Common Law Pure Trust Organization, uh, what we call the Stealth LLC, which uh, if you have a Common Law Trust, you don't have an EIN, so you can't have banking. So if you want to put a business in trust, what do you do with the money? The solution is to set up We call it a stealth LLC. It's a limited liability company out of South Dakota, which has the best privacy protections of all the uh, of all the states. Uh, The identity of the owner, the member, the manager is not in the public record. And the EIN that comes with it is not connected to your Social Security number. Um, There are other there are other juridical entities, fictitious entities for international use. Okay, we have private interest foundations, international business corporations, my book, The American Sovereign, How to Live Free from Government Regulation, as well as the other books I've written um, and other material, um, CDs, DVDs, all of that's in there under products, under services. Give it a look. Uh, You will also find that if you look under, there's a, a column there on the homepage that talks about conference calls every week on Tuesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, I do a conference call for a couple of hours where people can call and ask me questions about any of these types of issues, sovereignty issues, uh, freedom issues, uh, your rights, uh, common law trust, whatever it is, the RV, okay? Uh, you can give a call there. If you don't, if you're not able to listen live, you can also listen on um, uh, on the replay. And I have a telegram, I have a couple of telegram channels as well. If you go to my website under conference calls at the bottom of the section, you'll see a bright blue button. Click here, join Brent on telegram. It'll get into the telegram community of truth and freedom lovers. I'd love to see you there as well. So get in touch, phone number, website, telegram, however you like to do it. I would love to hear from you and we can indeed help you to live free from government control. That's what we do out there. Uh, My final thoughts are, it's always about truth and freedom as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Independence now, uh, that's that's the mantra by which I live. And I invite you to join me in being part of that community of independence and freedom lovers. Thank you so much, John. It's always a pleasure being with you. And I will look forward to the next time we get together. You're welcome. And uh, also on the back of what Brent was talking about with the reset, if any of you are looking for currencies, Dinar, Dong, Zim, Boulevard, Thai Bot, what, what have you, uh, there we have some different options. We will leave that link in the description along with Brent's information. Thanks, Brett, again for joining us. We look forward to having you again shortly. And thanks for your time.